Chad asked me if I'd speak a little bit about electrics today, specifically Lucas Electrics. Um, that's kind of what we deal with, with the old cars. Um, so what I'd like to do today is just share some, some things I've found and a little bit that we know about them and whatnot and dispel some of the myths. Um, I'll try to be, uh, you know, as politically correct as I can, but I've got to throw a little disclaimer in here that, uh, you know, some of these things, they are what they are. And uh, I'll try to stay away from any opinions. I don't like opinions. I like to just stick with the facts, and that's what I like about electrics. They either work or they don't, and you can back it up with science on how they do work. But as I'm sure everybody in here knows, Lucas has this horrible reputation, and everybody's got opinions about Lucas systems. But to be honest with you, in reality, I found the systems were designed pretty well. You've got you to think of it in the context of when they were designed and what they were designed to do. And uh, what we've found on a lot of the stuff is that when problems creep in, it's not so much the original design of the system. Uh, I'd say their biggest downfall was that in that era, the way the systems were designed, they were designed just. There's not a lot of excess capacity for anything. And uh, so with that, we'll go on. Um, a little overview of what I thought we'd do. Uh, we'll talk about just um, some of the basics of electricity. I believe that when you know the basics and how things function, it'll help you figure out what the heck is going on down the road. And uh, that's the thing about electric, electricity, electronics. Uh, there is science behind it. And try as you might, you can't break the laws of science. It's going to catch up to you sooner or later. But when you know those things and relationships between things, it makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on with your system. Um, so, uh, who am I and how am I qualified to talk to you about this? So I'll give you a little background. I don't, you know, most of you club members don't know me. Um, I, I, when I was 16 years old, I received my first uh, FCC license for non-voice communication. And then at 21, I got the one for voice communication. So I have a little background in electrics from hobbies and whatnot. I've owned um, uh, 10 British cars in my lifetime. And uh, I own four and a half right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of Jaguars, um, Triumphs, MGs, whatnot. So I've had a lot of fun over the years working on British electrics, and I, I, I understand them pretty well. And that's the neat thing about them, too. They're really pretty darn basic. Once you learn the basics, and like I say, once you know the principles of what's going on behind the scenes, it kind of starts to make sense to you, as crazy as that sounds. I know there's people that say Lucas Electrics never make sense, but they actually do. They're not that bad. Um, so anyways, uh, I retired from Northwest Natural Gas after 27 years, met Chad, and I was really impressed with what he did here. And so it's been a little over two years two now. Years, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you know, being retired, I thought I'd stay retired, but I didn't. I took early retirement and uh, came to work for Chad, and we've had a blast working on cars. And it's people like you that make it fun. It's our customers, really. It sounds really corny, but we get a lot of satisfaction when somebody brings a car in that's running like crap or has issues and they drive it out and it works and it's it sounds corny but it's pretty rewarding and uh with chad and now sam working here we've got a good a good group and we're all we have what i call philosophical alignment we all are on that same page we know we're never going to make a ton of money working on these old british buckets of crap but we have a lot of fun <laughs> doing it <laughs> like i said i'm gonna try to stay politically correct but they are what they are <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's my background. Um, I got my pilot's license when I was 22 years old. I've messed around with a lot of ele airplane electronics. Um, and then I started racing cars after that. And I had uh, a lot of success in that. I campaigned Formula Continental, Formula Libra, uh, regionally and nationally, and won a championship and had a lot of fun doing that. Um, so that's my background. And uh, probably my biggest claim to fame here at the shop is... Uh, been able to solve some real electric mysteries. We've worked on cars. I don't want to brag about the shop. I'm not here to sell you on the shop or anything. But um, we've taken on some challenges that no other shop in town would even touch that um, just would not make financial sense. I mean, when you've seen a Jaguar wired in all one color wire from the firewall forward, that's a challenge. Okay? Or when you've with got doorbell it, wire though, with, yeah, and with doorbell the, wire with all white wire, yeah, <laughs> all white wire, doorbell wire, two flashers hanging from the doorbell wire, <laughs> and we had uh, when I first started, uh, and boy, I don't mean to 
you know, discourage anyone's cars or projects, but we had a Datsun Roadster in here that had had an engine swap to a modern uh, engine with a, a computerized ECU. And uh, they decided to just splice all the wires together with, you know, twisting and a little black tape. And, and one foot of wire would change its color like it was ridiculous. <laughs> we had black and red, yellow and green. Yeah. <laughs> it was the most bastardized mess I've ever seen in my life. You literally, you literally could not unscrew the oil filter from the engine. They had put the engine in with the oil filter right up against the frame of the car. Did your best friend at that particular point have a pair of wire cutters? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. And I, I still to this day, I don't know why they would, they spliced in, you know, four inch sections of wire. And, and the ECM on that is, is literally a plug with what, 37 connections in it? So it was an absolute nightmare, but proud to say we solved it. Got it running and driving, and it was practical. And we put aftermarket yeah. instruments in it that worked beautifully. And yeah, it yeah, out real good. That was a real challenge. Um, we had uh, uh, another claim to fame. I got it. Are there any bug eye sprite owners in here? <laughs> Yay! All right. <laughs> Two. Right here. Three. If you, yeah, yeah. Well, if you want to convert to LED lights and you want that single indicator to work on your dash, I'm the only one in the United States that knows how to do that. <laughs> um, the, the company that sells that light kit, the, we had one, the owner, uh, he couldn't, couldn't make it work. He tried everything they suggested. They said it'll just never work. And uh, I played with it for a while and, and kept looking at the circuitry and ended up with kind of a, a bridge rectifier that I built out of diodes and darned if the stupid thing didn't work. And so uh, I won't reveal the circuitry because I'm going to retire on that one. The demand for those is <laughs> right through the roof. They're going to be beating down my door for that conversion. <laughs> so enough about me. Um, let's talk about the basics of electricity. Uh, if we're going to understand what all these devices on your car do, we've got to understand the relationship behind it a little bit. It'll make it a lot easier. If you bear with me through this, I'll try not to put you to sleep, but if you just bear with me, at the end, it'll all come together and it'll kind of make sense. But there is an absolute ohms law, and there's a relationship between watts, amps, volts, and ohms. And these are the mathematical formulas you can use to solve all of that. Now, wh what in the world am I bringing that up for? What has that got to do with electricity? Well. A lot of what we see is because of these relationships. So if you've got a switch on your dash for your wipers and the thing is burnt out, it doesn't make contact anymore, your wipers won't work. We've had people say, well, I know my wiper motor is good because when I touch the wires together, they run. It's just the switch. Well, here's the problem. When you look at this relationship, what you can see is that the higher the voltage, the more amps you can carry the less the amp draw is, okay? I'll give you a good example of this. In your home, your dryer runs on 220 or 240 rather than 110. Do you know why that is? It's so that the conductor can be smaller because there's less amp draw at 240 volts than there is at 120 if you tried to run the same 1500 watt dryer. You see what I'm saying? There's a direct mathematical relationship there. That's why airplanes generally 24 volts. You can go 24 volts in an airplane, you use smaller wire and carry the same load. So you save weight. Okay? It's, it's that thing of resistance, amp draw, and voltage. Direct relationship there. So where I'm going with that wiper motor situation is, you got to say, why did that switch burn out? Why did the contacts arc and fry? Why did the plastic melt? What happened? Yeah, his wiper motor is still working when he touches the wires together. But when it was originally designed, it was a 12 watt motor. It was supposed to draw 12 watts. What's happened is the bearings have gotten gummy, chewed up, it's old, it's tired, maybe some of the windings are shorted on the armature, the commutator's all dirty, so the resistance goes up. When the resistance goes up, the amp draw increases. So now that little switch on your dash that was designed to handle 12 watts or 14 amps or 14 watts which if you look at the math at 12 volts 12 watts is one amp that's uh where we at here watts volts amps okay well now because that motor it's got so much drag on it and it's dragging it's not drawn 12 watts anymore 14 watts now it's drawn 24. so the switch that was rated and when lucas designed it they only envisioned one amp being drawn through it. Now it's having to carry two amps or three amps when it's really cold outside. 
that extra amp draw with the resistance in the switch heats the switch up, it burns out, the plastic melts, the spring that holds the contacts together loses its tension, and your switch goes bad. So that's why we have a, a saying here around the shop that when it comes to electrics, it's never one thing. <laughs> it sounds horrible, but I guarantee you, it's never one thing. And sometimes you, you might think, you know, well, that's crazy, but you have to kind of look back and say, why did that switch fail? Well, is it just crappy Luca stuff? No. When it was designed, I guarantee it, it would handle the load. But over time, things age, they put more amp draw on it, and that's probably the most common thing that we see with electrics is that they get old, they get tired. Now, I'm also, bear with me, and I'm going to talk about replacement parts. It's a whole nother bag of worms, okay? But that's, that's the basic, um, you know, theory of electricity. Basically, what electricity is, everybody knows this, it's just the movement of electrons through a conductor, right? You've got negatively charged electrons that move. And here's a news flash for everybody. The British had it right, okay? The world, Earth, is actually positive. So positive ground was correct. <laughs> okay. The crazy Americans got it backwards and kind of overtook the market. And, but in reality, Earth is a positive ground. So we're kind of working backwards to how the universe works. A little news flash for you there. Um, Big deal is, does it really make any difference? It really doesn't make difference other than um, elect electrolytic corrosion. Yeah. Okay, electrolysis. It's going one way or it's going the other. Yeah. yeah. It's still just electrons moving through a conductor. Okay. So, um, anything that's got, you know, and, and that's important to know that like charges, uh, unlike charges attract and like charges repel. Okay. And it's kind of important to know that too. But other than that, no big thing. So, where does electricity come from? Well, there's about six different ways you can make electricity. You can make it with friction. We've all seen static electricity, right? Um, pressure, like you push down on a crystal. You've, you know the barbecue lighters that you have, those little piezo crystals? That's a crystal. And when you push on that and you snap across it, you get a spark that lights your barbecue. Um, heat, you take a thermocouple and you heat it up. That'll make electricity. And a thermocouple is just two dissimilar metals fused together, expand at a different rate so the electrons get excited and they start moving and that, that makes electricity. Um, light, you got photosensitive materials for that. Uh, magnetism, okay, this one we do deal with. Coils, okay, generators, alternators. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, that's the relative movement of a magnet and a wire. It creates electricity. Uh, and then the big one we deal with is chemical, battery. You got two plates in there, dissimilar metals. You got an electrolytic solution in between that electrons can pass through, and you got a battery. And we all, we all deal with batteries. Um, and then electromagnetic fields. That's your motors and coils and whatnot. So we kind of already talked on this. I don't want to get too deep into the science, but I just wanted to show you, and, and you can copy this down or whatever, but it's pretty simple. And this is the basis of all, of all electricity. And those formulas do not lie. And so that's just something to keep in mind. And, and I'll try to tie that back to, to, to the car world here. So if you've got uh, your ignition switch in a Lucas system, when that was designed, a lot of these cars, and, and again, I'm going to use generalities here. So when I get all done, you know, please don't try to nail me to the cross on, hey, you said there's only three wires on there. I'm talking generally, okay? So let's picture a, a simple circuit. When you turn your key on, you're going to supply power to your coil and some other circuits. Usually it's like your wiper circuit becomes energized, some things like that. Um, where, we, where we get into trouble is when we start adding things to that. That switch, when it was designed, when the Lucas engineers, and, and they did have engineers. <laughs> I'm sure they did. <laughs> they would calculate the total amp draw of everything you want to run, your lights, whatever's on that circuit, and the wire would be sized accordingly, and the switch and the contacts and the pressure on those contacts would be sized accordingly, and in their engineering, it would work. It would just work. That's the key. There's not a lot of excess capacity there, 
okay? Think of it in today's terms, it's like they're using all the memory that they've got in that computer at that point. There might be a few gigabytes extra, but you're not going to run a whole bunch of stuff off of that circuit. Well, what happens is these cars are 60 years old, people change things, they start adding things, they want to upgrade, right? You want to run some 55 watt halogen fog lights. Well, you don't want them to be on you know, all the time, so you run it through that ignition switch and then you get power from that. Well, now all of a sudden, 55 watt light at 12 volts, that's 4 amps, over 4 amps. You got two of them. You're drawing another 8 amps through that ignition switch. It is not going to last. It's, it can't carry that load. You'd be lucky if the wires don't melt on a Lucas system. So we'll get into how you handle that and they do that by assigning relays and we'll talk about relays. But that's, that's kind of what we see. It's where we start adding things or things age and they start putting more load on the system. Um, so, 